All right, so welcome. It is August 16th. Um, sort of summer is dwindling down. Uh, the weather is looking great. It's 99 degrees. It's freezing in Texas. <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's really uh, fascinating that the fall is coming up and uh, we pretty soon we'll be talking about Thanksgiving and uh, Christmas and where did this year go? Man, it's going fast. So anyway, before we get rolling, we have our own John Sibley Butler. Let's see if we can get some music from him. Oh, the leaves are brown and the sky I went for a walk on a winter day. You know the preacher likes to go. I want to say, California, on a winter day. All right, all right. There Thank you. Go. There you go. John Butler, how are you, sir? I am doing well. It is very interesting to look at the news these days because it's all combining with our major our major concentration. Um looking at is the whole idea of the weather, is it here? Is is I mean, is is the warming here? Is the earth warming? And then of course that's into intervene with everything else that's around the world that's related by the way so it's pretty interesting to work up wake up to a normal girl uh, normal a normal can you hear me i mean is yeah the warming here yeah it's all right to it's okay to wake up to a normal world and then read that maybe maybe you're alive when the world changes in terms of temperature so is global warming here is it here and the other thing in the midst of that it's like it's on a stage. Everything keeps going. Uh, the stock market is up, but I do expect a correction here uh, uh, pretty soon. And the significance of that, if you look at the number of 501Cs that have developed, if you look at how people are looking at the world now, for example, I'm involved with a group in Austin that's providing um, training, if you will, for refugees, right? Uh, from Europe and the war and from South America, where this training for buses just got a one point eight million dollar grant. Uh, that's with Anjum Malak from the House of Tutors, and it's just it's it's just pretty interesting to see. But here's the thing, Andreas, America is still the place that there, there would be nobody to send us water. There would nobody nobody to have airlifted food to us. There would be nobody to take care of us. So what we've talked about on this pro on this program is solving those problems that we must solve in the world. And then, of course, we've got the worst political stuff since I've been alive uh, that's coming along. So, you know, in my in my view, the world is always economics. Can you feed yourself? Look at all the migration of people around around the globe, not just the migration to America and to Texas. Look at the migration of people around the globe. And people still are looking to America, even though we're concerned with our issues of supply chain, we're concerned with our issues with China, we're concerned with, with, with supporting Europe, should we send stuff, stuff, stuff to Ukraine? Because it looks like even with all our problems under us, America is still the last best hope. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with that. Uh, Llewellyn King, how are you, sir? Welcome back. Very well, thank you. I've just returned from Europe, and uh, it's extremely interesting. Also, it's very hot. I went along the Dalmatian coast, uh, <clears throat> seeing the former Yugoslavia, which is now mostly booming, largely thanks to tourism, um, and uh, the impact on the coastal cities of the cruise ship industry, which is considerable. Uh, but generally, uh, I've been to Europe quite a bit lately. There's less anxiety, or I didn't hear it, about Ukraine than there was. Uh, it sort of settled into this terrible killing field, uh, somewhat reminiscent of what happened in World War One, and uh, 
uh, people are sort of inured to the horror of it, which is a very frightening thing. By and large, Europe is doing not badly at all. The UK is in a terrible mess, having uh, followed through on Brexit and gotten out of the European Union, but also it has terrible politics. It had a series of prime ministers. It has a conservative party, which doesn't seem to remember that it's conservative. It has high deficits, high taxes, and not a lot of room to move. There's a, a slowdown by doctors, something we haven't seen in Britain in a long time, a return of strikes, which they call euphemistically industrial action. But the rest of Europe seems to be doing quite well. The refugee problem is enormous. Britain is getting about a thousand or more refugees a day crossing the English Channel. It's only about 25 miles from France to England, uh, and they don't know what to do with them. This is, uh, you know, with about 60, I think, 65 million people in Britain, something like that. This is a lot to absorb with all the things we hear here. Where do you put them? Do you put them in hotels? How do you feed them? Who's responsible? Um, where do you send them to? Can you expect, can, and as yet, I'm glad to hear what Johnny said, but as yet, they don't seem to be able to find the skills they need in the refugees because there are so many and handling them is a very difficult problem. Uh, a lot of attention was paid to a barge, which they have, uh, it's equipped to take 500 people, but a thousand a day, what is 500? It's nothing. Uh, and they're coming in, they, they need services, they're hungry, they're in terrible, deplorable shape. But if you want to understand why people are migrating, just look at this horror story out of Nigeria, where four men hid on the, on the uh, rudder of a ship, and they got to Brazil. They didn't know where the ship was going, but anything rather than where they were, and they ended up in Brazil. That shows you the degree of despair which drives migration. Unfortunately, Europe is not doing well at absorbing its migrants. Sweden, which was very proud of its uh, generosity to, to migrants, to immigrants, uh, and was a sort of model country in many ways, now has terrible problem with gangs and uh, uh, social unrest and crime. And across Europe, there's huge fear that with this huge, large number of people coming in, that they will bring with them all the problems that come with migrants, which is uh, usually drugs and crime. And there are too many really to assimilate uh, into Europe. The people trying to get out of Africa coming across the Mediterranean into the southern tier of European countries is large. and and very worrisome. So it's not just us that are dealing with them. We are a large country with a greater capacity to absorb than many of these European countries. And still, it goes on. Globally, we're going to have to do something about the North-South divide so that people are not driven out of their new homes. Every time there's a new war in Africa, more migrants. Every time there's an upheaval and starvation in Latin America, more migrants. Um, and we, we've, it's a global problem, and it needs a global solution, and nobody has proposed one. It's sort of like the other problem we have domestically in the U.S., which is housing. We don't have enough houses, and we have too many uh, restrictions on building new houses. And we have a huge political divide, and neither side is dealing with these issues. They're busy slagging on each other and not dealing with these issues. And we have in the prospect of voting for one of two old men who don't have any ideas about the crises of the moment. Uh, well said, well said, well said. Well, you know, I have an idea before we go to our superstar guest. Um, I think everybody should go to college, you know, take four years off, go to college, get another degree, get an education. If you, you know, can uh, go to, a, you know, many of these countries have free college tuition. Um, so I think that that's what people should be doing. People should be, you know, focused on getting better, increasing their 
uh, capabilities and the skill sets and these are people uh, <laughs> who have nothing to eat and nothing to wear and no shoes well, but if you, go to college, you, if, if, if you go to college there are programs for for students for eating and all this thing I don't know I'm just, I'm just you, I think you, they know, you know you know Latin America you know how deep the poverty is I know Africa I know how extraordinarily deep the poverty is where there is no nothing to eat day after day by many people. I've always said, and I as um, Damon and some of our viewers know, I grew up in Africa, and there is a kind of thinness that bodies have. People who've never, ever had enough to eat. No wonder they're prepared to risk their lives uh, to try to get to a country which is better ordered. Unfortunately, in the course of what they're seeking, the, the better ordered country, they're likely to disorder it because mm -hmm. make no mistake migrants are very destabilizing we saw it happen in lebanon we saw it happen in in jordan uh everywhere you get a very large uncontrolled migrant flow you get a certain amount of destabilizing mm -hmm. and we're seeing it with gang warfare across europe which is terrifying it is the, solution for, the solution for america is put them in the military we fought World War I with Italian immigrants. We fought the Civil War with ex-slaves. We fought World War, World War II. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, no, I, I'm so not. not I don't let's don't put that, them in the college. Let's put them in the military. I, I think that's uh, not a bad idea, but you're not afraid to put the, all the mothers and their babies in the military. No, of course not. Of course not. Course <laughs> not. Anyway, I wonder, I wonder if our guests may have an answer <clears throat> because, you know, maybe technology can solve all these problems. I don't know. But let's say hello to Dr. Damien Valle. Damien, how are you, sir? I'm doing good, thank you. Well, thanks for being here. Hello, you. Damien. Hello, hey, Damien, buddy. how are you doing, sir? I'm doing just fine, thank you. So, so Damien is an assistant professor at Texas State University in the School of uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering. And um, he's... Uh, doing all kinds of amazing things. And I want him to maybe take some time to talk a little bit about his responsibilities and then tell us a little bit about some of the cool projects that he's working on. Well, my responsibilities are sometimes long, long list of things, but uh, it, they're fun uh, nonetheless. But uh, well, I mean, I, I joined the faculty here because I was excited about research. Uh, research especially focused on uh, AI, machine learning, deep learning, and its implementations and computational uh, requirements. And I think one of the main reasons that brought me in is because one, probably they didn't have a faculty who could do all these things. And two, um, I, I think the, the way going forward in engineering has been leaning towards how computationally efficient are we becoming or there's a need for that, right? So a lot of the things I play with, I call it playing up, my students call it work, but the, the way of, of, of doing AI into solving different complicated problems, it's, it's becoming a, a way to engineer a new way of, of thinking about complex problems into ways that I never learned in school. And I think that it's becoming a very essential tool for a lot of our students uh, trying to find a job and, and given the, the way the market's moving, the way companies are looking for people, it's just uh, it, the, the students understand what they need, right? And so I think we're expanding that skill set for them. I think mm -hmm. we're broadening our way of the way we're teaching very differently the way maybe definitely the way I went to school right and uh, students learn it differently the way traditional schooling has been done in the last forever years right and so uh, we're in an age in where students grew up with Google and Amazon in their lives ever since they were born they had a, a click of a button to have anything they needed right and so we're dealing with a new generation that has a different uh, outlook in how they're going to prepare for their careers right. and how they want to engineer that. So, so let's let's get into it right, right away with you. For example, what are your thoughts as a professor with something like ChatGPT? Do you allow it in your classroom? 
uh, what are the boundaries of things like that? Where, uh, how are all these new technologies and tools uh, helping or not helping? Or what are your thoughts of what's going to happen? Well, it's it's going to be the same way Google was quote unquote destructive when it came out for classrooms, but this is a little different, right? Because it won't just give you the answer. It will not just write you the answer. It will explain the answer, right? So we're dealing with a different tool, right? It's like having your own private Twitter on the tip of your phone, right? Because you can get ChatGTP app into your phone and have it uh, good to go. I don't, I was one of the maybe, I, I really don't know, but I was one of the faculty who decided early on to be an adaptable to chat GTP in the classroom and use it as a tool to teach, use it as a tool for them to learn. And I use it on my research, right? So I, I couldn't really find a way to be restrictive to it. Nothing that made sense in my head was good enough to say, well, I have to keep it out. I, I didn't find a logical reason or a technical capability in order, in order to do that. Mm -hmm. So. I've been open about it. I think chat GTP is just one of the many variations we'll see. Uh, there's hack GTP. So now you can have GTP hacking something. Now you can have evil GP, GPT and that does evil things, right? And, and we're gonna see more variations of this thing that you know people are just gonna adapt to train it. And, and so, then it's, it's a matter of you knowing how to use it or not. Right. Yeah. That's basically so, so, so help us as an expert on AI and all that, Damien, help us understand um, how, how does it work? So what's the difference between Google search engine, getting all this content versus a chat GPT? What is chat GPT doing that is different that they not only gets to find out where the answer is, but now it, it takes all that information and creates a response. Well, what's going on in the compute side? Well, in the compute side is that ChatGTP was built out of a network that we call that basically a model. And, and the model was trained with a large corpus of the internet that has anything that was publicly available and, and then enhance and inherit all that information. Besides that, it had to be smart enough to understand the queries that we put in like Google. Right when we're searching something, we have to put in a query in there. So the same thing with Chat GTP. If you want to converse with it, you have to just query any questions or any kind of uh, line you want to interact with. the The difference here is that Google is great at locating the information for you, at least the links in which could probably give you the answer. This thing doesn't do that. It just gives you the answer. It can formulate it. It can change it. It can transform it. It can customize it, it can refine it, it can improve it. And at the same time, given enough information, you can learn to perfect it, right? And so that's why Microsoft paid a lot for it because it's a smart business decision to own it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and you cannot devalue that kind of potential in the tool that can redefine the way we move forward with anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, Professor, and uh, welcome to Texas State, and and I just retired as a professor, and oh, 40 nice. plus years ago, I was there as an assistant professor, and 16 books and 300 articles later, <laughs> here I am. Well, let me take you some of the things, the difference between tools and thinking. So when I really wanted to get my methods class interesting, I would take my slide rule in. And I would say I didn't need to plug it up. Right. I didn't need to do anything. And I could do everything. But of course, these kids grew up with calculators. And when I was a mere lad, I can remember the discussions about television is here. Now students never have to go to class again. Right. And then when it came to how we can pull, don't tell the computer what to do, but the computer can learn for itself. We now have the chat stuff that's going on. But here is your, as a young professor, here is your job as, as to why my good buddy, bourgeois, good LSU guy, 
your provost. <laughs> right. I want to know what are you doing in your field that can be commercialized to create new companies in the great state of Texas in the world? I've always said in public that wealth creation and business start not with accounting, finance, and management, but rather science and technology. So Google is the present now. Chat PTA is the present now. And we know that that will all be obsolete in the future. Because as a professor, I can tell you this, I can tell when people were plagiarizing, there was a, as you know, uh, there was, there was a, uh, an algorithm where I could pick up any paper that they, they, play, they plagiarized, right? I knew that. So my question is you, as you, as you enter our, <laughs> our region here, how do you see your part of engineering contributing to the technology transfer for business enterprise? Who would be the next Google? That's obsolete to me, that's GPT. Who, who would be the next Dell? Who would be the next Southwest Airlines? Would they be here? When you get my age, I don't think so. So how do you think about the future and attributing your research to business development? Right, so research, we, if we start with research, I think it's part of the stepping stone in being able to do a business, right? So uh, I think part of the skills in order to generate a, a successful business it's a skill that it's hard to maintain because I think engineering and technology provides a great skill to understand what's out there and be able to to pro probably address a gap in that. I think that gives you the advantage of creating that business success. And I think that the research that comes with it will be understandable. I, th I think uh, creating a job like that will require not just the understanding of science and technology, but the imagination of being able to see the purpose and the need at a large scale that we're largely missing. I, I think that it's gonna take a lot of great thorough thinking, right? Which is really difficult to do when you're asking a 20 year old to do out of just based on research work, right? So it, it's experience also, I think you, this, this guys will need to get more experience in the base of seeing what's going on in the business, but also how you manage those things. And, and the commercialization of any research project is daunting because- think, Yeah, and what I'm saying is uh, Microsoft is a, is a computer science company. He didn't invent anything. Yeah. Uh, Dale, uh, putting together computers, he didn't invent anything. And the biology now, I do, I do biotech now, and we do all the stuff in the laboratory. I agree with you. And remember that Dale was 20 when he started <clears throat> Dale. Yeah. Gates was 21. I guess what I'm getting to is in the dynamics of Texas State and hooking up with the entrepreneur students who can take your science and technology and commercialize it. I've worked with many engineers. I've worked with many si scientists in the lab. You know, we just want to, most professors are not capitalist, capitalist peers like me. They just want to win the, national, the Nobel Prize, right? And well, I wanted to do both, right? So my question is, have you connected, bring, I mean, have you connected to the business students? Have you connected to the entrepreneurship clubs as you go forward in your own research so it's not done in a vacuum? <clears throat> Right, so not to the students themselves. I think uh, definitely with the uh, IP office at the university are, are the ones who are helping me understand these steps and leveraging how we go about, you know, creating this IP uh, workflow towards things that we do in lab, right? And we, we've been able to start in a few of my projects working on uh, funding for those things. Uh, NSFI core is definitely one of the pathways that I've taken one of the projects already and we're looking to bigger funding to create the, the final product. But the patent uh, aspect, the business aspect, the way we need to conduct research and interviews and be able to see if it's liable, right? It's, it's a lot of work that it's beyond the 
usual professorship uh, and duties and, and then be able to recognize, well, am I heading in the right direction, right? Because uh, interviews can tell you right away, interviewers can tell you this is not good, this is really good, or this is useful, or implement something useful. But to, to attach this to a business student, I think I think you it would need to be more of a collaboration with somebody in the faculty. That way, they can see how this can be interacted in a well way manner of, of doing an entrepreneurship from a research project. That well, I well today I'm going to make you, I'm going to make you a fellow of Andre Cavallo's center. <laughs> so that he, he's already our, he's already so there. He's already from, there from the peer researchers <laughs> like myself and understand wealth creation through research. So right now you're a fellow, when it, whenever you need to say you have a great idea or you do a conference, think how can we commercialize this and go see Andreas. And then when you're successful, you turn around and do like the right. Google did and give South, right. give Texas State, you know, a billion dollars. Right. Good answer, professors and welcome. And, and by the way, three things under review at all times, okay? Three things in a row. Oh, that's that's been preached to me since my first semester. But that it was a not, it wasn't three, it was two. No, I three think things that the professor was hit, and hit your top journalist once, okay? In the first yeah. five years. Okay. I'm yeah. sorry. Uh Lou Ellis, I had to do a little mentoring there. Uh since I'm one of the great professors ever go through the University of Texas publication wise. And you know, I now will never toot my own horn. I'm taking shy lessons now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Andres is laughing. I'm going to let that pause. Um, when it's climbed down on a lip, and I have nothing to help it with but a chainsaw, uh, well, it is really no challenge in it. So I'll let it pause. Uh, I, I'm very interested in, in AI. I've written quite a bit about it. I've talked to a lot of experts on it, both in universities and in its applications. It, for example, the utility industry. Uh, at least 25 utilities are using artificial intelligence in different applications. What's interesting is they're not using it for the same thing. They're using it for different things. Uh, San Diego Gas and Electric is using it for fire suppression by identifying vulnerable trees, trees that are dead or dying. Um, others are using it as a management tool and others are looking at it as a tool to deal with customers, where it seems to have a rather obvious use. But then there are so many fascinating and unexpected places where AI has raised its head. One of which I've just written an article about it um, is AI and religion. I mean, and the simplistic bit about it is fascinating. The simplistic bit about it is, uh, you know, it'll help pastors write their sermons, you know, that sort of thing. Okay. The big churches are looking at it in pastoral help, how they deal with the, uh, the congregation, how they write sympathy notes, that kind of thing. But the other side of it is AI has a lot of the, the things which are associated with a religion itself. And that's something quite different. And so, of course, I went on chat GPT to find out what it thinks about its own role and whether it thinks it will become a god. And basically, it's not sure whether it will or won't. Uh, but he does <laughs> suggest that people will get a lot of comfort, that it will modify their prayer, that it can be, uh, because it has all these qualities, all these godlike qualities. It's ubiquitous, it's omnipresent. Uh, it, it's uh, very adaptive to the sensitivity of what it's asked. I found that just researching as a journalist, uh, how you ask it a question, it frightens me a bit because it knows where I live. And I think it's going, <laughs> I asked it whether it thought it would turn itself into a god. And it sort of wavered on that a bit and said, no, it thought not, but some people might think that, yeah, which is quite scary. Right, uh, right. I, I, I wanted to ask it whether it was in any way related to the devil, but I didn't have the moral courage <laughs> in case the answer was rather terrifying. A serious question. Um, 
And I go back to something I've talked about on this broadcast previously, and that is everybody I ask about what's going to be the impact of artificial intelligence on employment, and they all say, well, automation, an and they immediately do a, a, an extension from automation uh, and uh, and some other television, some other computer has started talking by itself. Obviously, it's coming. But it's I think coming AI, AI is trying to AI is trying to interfere your so far is it's not man. Automation created jobs because it made products. Automation uh, increased productivity. Ergo, it created right. jobs because it made stuff and paid people who wanted the stuff, et cetera. But I cannot find that dynamic so far in AI. Of course, I went and asked ChatGPT and it waffled. It didn't give me a hard answer. Uh, mm -hmm. But it looks to me, what we know so far is that it will not necessarily follow the automation pattern, well established going back to the invention of the steam engine, Instead, it will do something very disturbing, which is it will subtract jobs. And all the companies that are looking at it are not looking at it because it will add jobs. They're looking at it so it will subtract them. Uh, for example, one of the fast food chains, when you go and order from your car window, there could be no human beings involved. Um, so I wonder, what, as a, a true expert, which I certainly am not, um, uh, what do you think about that question? Right. So th there is a section of AI, I think, in highly academic and industrial about the ethics of AI. And, and part of the discussion of ethics comes about the human impact of what we're doing. It's not just about the, the design of the purpose of the AI, but the, the larger question that every conference will ask themselves is, what do we do with the unemployment? dissatisfied employees that get laid out because of automation, because of AI. And it's a, it's a question that it does have the Nobel Prize behind it. Uh, if you can answer that, you should get that price immediately because there is a large sense of we know that it can come anytime or that we can come in 10 years, regardless of when it comes. The problem that it creates, it's a very large engineering, societal, governmental issue moving forward because it has large consequences. When you do have a replacement of people in the work, workforce, there is a large sense of dissatisfaction uh, among the population, about the state, the county, wherever you live. And what happens economically that destroys communities, right? It, it can destroy a lot of the moral and confidence and everything that we can do. And, and one of the things I like about the automation of the fast food drive-throughs is that, not that I don't like the fact that they can automate it. I hate the fact that it was an initial employment for a lot of high school, college students who took that first job at McDonald's or, some kind of a fast food chain that created a character or discipline towards a workflow mentality where a lot of the my friends when we were at that age, most of them worked at, at a fast food chain, right? And I think that created a chain reaction to their career path and becoming later professionals, family people, everything that we characterize as good in our society, right? And I think that's been taken away and the ripple effect is hard to see because I don't know how vast the ripple will be. We can understand the immediate impact to logical outcomes to like replacing somebody from their position, but what is the ripple effect of replacing that person, right? And, and, and the ethical aspect of, well, just because we can, should we do it, right? That's the ethical, part in which either the company, the engineer, the person handling this should ask themselves, right? Because at the end of the day, there is a human component to all of this. There has to be. Otherwise, it's bound to fail at some point. So 
it will not wipe it out completely, but the problem becomes maybe very few can actually get in there and do it. So I like what you said when you said, uh, should we do it because we can do it? That's a very yeah. potent question. But the answer, I think, is that in a capitalist society, if we can do it, it's economically attractive, we will do it. Uh, but we're facing a set of challenges here that we've never seen heretofore. Uh, exciting and terrifying. But wouldn't but wouldn't wouldn't the outcome outcome could be, or the way of thinking about it is that there's a lot of uh, sort of call it mundane tasks from sewing to flipping a burger to uh, inoculating a person, or there are many things that are kind of simple that a robot could do. And if a robot can do it, then those humans should be taking John Butler's uh, classical music uh, lessons or, you know, and they could be learning <laughs> something new. I mean, is, well, is uh, the fact yeah. somebody, so, so my point is, is the fact that, is the fact that humans that do mundane work mean that they don't have other skills and they can be replaced no. and they cannot learn something new? Or perhaps this is an opportunity to have people do more meaningful things other than mundane tasks. I don't know. I mean, I'm just. I, I think I can partially answer that. And a lot of people who do mundane things, and I've seen them in construction, I've seen them in restaurants, do them because they really cannot do more. Not because they're not trained, not because they're not educated. Those things are also true, but because they simply aren't, do not have the capacity to do complex things. I saw that when I used to have a publishing, I used to own a publishing company and I had my own printing works and I could see it there. Some of the men were extraordinarily gifted and could do a much more interesting job than, and some were struggling to do this rather rudimentary work. Uh, those are the people who are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. people who Let are me chime in on this. Uh... At this point to do rudimentary things, like John Sibley Butler, for example. Let, 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 let me chime in on this. Professor. Let's model this thing. And I'm going to go back as, uh, to my favorite economist, Schumpeter, the great Austrian economist, who was very different from everybody else. He had a company, and he had a, he had a theory called creative destruction. When we go back and model this stuff mathematically, this is what's true. Every change in technology has created more jobs. Can you imagine, and like I said before, being in Kansas when, when, when the good man created basketball and the guy stood up there and took the ball out the basket because it couldn't go through, and then they created nets and they said, who's going to take the ball out the basket now? So what happened with technological change, according to Schumpeter, is that when you model it mathematically, every movement from the airplane back to the printing press, horses and buggers, to the to the uh, combustion engine has created more jobs now the question is what kind of jobs will they be well Llewellyn when we look at it when we finish college and when I finish graduate school the jobs that we have now we're not here and and Llewellyn you have seen publishing just change you have seen newspapers disappear completely you have seen there's no place to to throw the newspaper for the newspaper guy anymore uh, there's no place for kids to learn because the filling station, now we have child labor laws, but I've been working ever since I was a little guy. So I just well, think- I, I, just, I, 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 job, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. Here. It still doesn't deal with the people of low qualification, um, given the, given low qualification in, in themselves in their, as they were. Uh, well, what it their, does. their intellectual limit and this business about a destructive creation this is true it's true except it's very uneven for example when artificial rubber came along it enabled a tremendous expansion of the automobile industry but it was hell in the amazon where a uh, whole society collapsed because of it or the abandonment for example of asbestos, which has caused a, create, a collapse of dependent uh, places in Africa. Um, there is a lot of human cost to this creative destruction. 
and not everything moves up. I was once took a taxi in rural England and the driver, a uh, nice man, it was just a regular car, that kind of taxi, and he had been an electronic engineer and he had given up because this is the whole world he knew of electronics was changing faster than he could keep up with it. So a lot of suffering, a lot of dis, you know, real disjointedness results from these changes. And we have to know what I, I'm trying to pose here as a question or a subject of thought is maybe AI does not have all the characteristics that you just said, John, that technology has had heretofore, that it has created jobs. We don't know that. There is no evidence it will create jobs. It is an expectation that it has no evidentiary base. But 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 let me let me switch gears real quick for Damien's sake. Uh, Damien, uh, when when you and I went to school, uh, programming was maybe a peripheral thing in engineering. Uh, and now every class, every course, you need to do programming pretty much, and and programming is clearly needed dramatically to do to to manifest and create AI everywhere. Uh, and, and, and I assume that there are thousands of platform opportunities for people with some knowledge of Python or whatever language they prefer to write code and make the next thing happen on a Raspberry Pi board or, I mean, sort of the sky is the limit. So, so help us understand, let's come back to, to why this is all happening. What are the top three projects you're working on? Wait, who, who is funding you? Well, why, why is this thing happening? Right, so let's, okay, so I'll start with the latter. Um, uh, I, I've been working on the smart firefighting uh, project for, for several years now. And it's basically a way of designing a rover, a, a autonomous units that go into a, structure that's on fire and do data collection to help firefighters do search and rescue and then be able to understand the situation much quicker without having to sacrifice many people. I think if we leverage technology AI in the sense of having really smart autonomous units being able to do that, uh, I think that will help first responders, not just firefighters, but anything that comes critical writing communities. And so uh, NSF through our NARIU has sponsored part of the sub pro pro project. Uh, currently, we I've joined the Translational Health Research Center as a faculty fellow. And they're, they're uh, in part um, offering us some of the funding for this project right now. And previously, this was initiated by uh, Dell and NVIDIA. Right, so this was a, a, a initialization from there, mainly because of the AI development that goes into that project. Mm -hmm. uh, the other funded projects have been the motion recognition. So uh, I'm working on developing a tool for children with autism to recognize emotions as a development tool. And that requires a way of developing the AI to recognize how humans display emotions. Uh, through either physiological cues and environmental cues. And so teaching a computer how to, to interpret emotions is a large task I, I did not consider at the beginning. In the way we biologically understand emotions, in the way we continue to uh, continue to learn how to do that, uh, even in, a, in adulthood, it's hard to teach this to a computer if you don't understand all the angles and all the effects that drive an emotional state, right? Mm -hmm. And so the research behind that, it, it goes many years, we would be working on it for four and a half years already, and it's still a challenging task, but we've done great improvements in, in being able to develop an app for children with autism and they can use it and see emotions uh, pop up and they can recognize happiness and sadness and things that are not comfortable doing, things that are not 
part of their development skill. And so as they grow older, they learn to identify these things with without the phone eventually, right? And so we've been working on all those things. And and those are those have been my two major projects. And lately I've been going into uh communication sites of of LoRa radio uh, communications and, and encryption into that field, right? We just finished a thesis on that. And uh, it looks like it, radio is becoming a, a large way of, of using it for, uh, for many of the applications that we're finding that are gonna be necessary. Part of it can be that smart firefighting, part of, of how we communicate data that's being collected during a fire. Right, so there's there's a lot of um, intercepts into these areas where AI plus the application involved with the human component to it, uh, it's it's becoming more relevant to into all of this. And Professor, that is so interesting to me because we had suggested with Nobel Prize winner that the distinction between the science and the social sciences should be deleted. So what you're saying is uh, you're really doing uh, uh, psychology, you're doing sociology. You're doing the movement of people and you're doing it with AI. So what has happened to disciplines, especially finance, with all of the great stuff, all the equations that we have on Wall Street, it did not come from finance, it came from physics. So we use the equations of physics to do that. So so it's very interesting when you talk about psychologists and social psychologists have been examining those things for years upon years. That is, if you go to the academic journal. So I think you see here emerging of different disciplines. Even now with all of the data that we have in social physics, I could I could write the equation for the movement of people better than a physicist could write the equation of the movement of rocks. And who the hell want to study rocks? <laughs> I want to study people. So my question is this, how do you see, do you have interaction with social psychology? Have you gone to the Journal of Social Psychology? How do you take the analog of what's in a person's head and create a, a, a computer image of that person. Yeah, and the absolutely. same thing is happening in, in sociology with social physics. So what sociologists are now doing is they're taking all of the data, all that they need is the credit card data, all they need is the GPS data, all they need is the buildings going on out, and, and you know all they need is the uh, facial recognition, and they can tell you where everybody is going. Right without asking right. one question. So, and that's right. called social physics. So how do you, how, how, are you interacting with psychology, social psychology to answer those questions? Yeah, yeah but, well, I'll tell you this much, John. Um, there are no engineering papers in what we're trying to do. So we have no other literature to go to, right? So um, one of the challenges my students and I, we've been working is that we have to interpret psychology journals and papers and research and researchers, um, how we interpret all these things, because if we're going to teach a machine how to do something and engineer the network that goes into it, into a human emotion, there are no engineering classes for that. And so- That's right, because engineers can do that. But what I'm saying, if you look at, for, if you look at neuroscience, right? If we look yeah. at a network, for example, a physical network, a biological network, all yeah. look the same, and a social network. Yeah. If mm -hmm. you print them out, they look the same. So I do network analysis and entrepreneurs, but the literature that I use with neuroscience, I look at how I look at how disease is spread within the human body for predictive purposes because of the movement of entrepreneurs and the networks looks just like that when you print it out. Yeah. That's uh, funny, right? And, and you know that. So so something is yeah. happening. With, yeah. with with networks because because the biology stuff and the physics stuff and the social stuff when we bring it together the disease is spread just like crime they look just like them right right so so i do think that by going to the site articles and and not, not just writing the equations but you need some interpretations right and I think, yeah, social psychology what you're talking yeah. about neuroscience you know yeah. the neuroscience because when we go to meetings now, we're all there together looking at all this data that looks just alike. I gave a talk in uh, at NASA about the impact of social physics, right, on management, and and they're saying, well, you know, it all looks it all looks alike except one is people and the other one is things. <laughs> so it's interesting. 
Absolutely. Yeah, so, so, Damien, re real quick to get your thoughts on a few things, uh, a bit of a fire, uh, quick fire uh, answers. Um, so, uh, the, the people would assume today that the cloud is the ultimate thing and everything is going to be in the cloud because it has infinite compute, the elastic way of growing it, so on and so on and so on. But uh, some people are saying, but but edge compute or compute at the at the place where the thing is happening is actually far more important. Uh, talk to us about that. That what what's going on with research and AI? Why would you need edge compute versus cloud compute, and what's driving one or the other? Well, I think the cloud is is well. It drives the fact that people need large computations for large data sets. Right, something you cannot host something locally, mm -hmm. and you need something remotely, and you need a lot of resources. Uh, it looks infinite because maybe you don't have the money to run the entire data center yourself, right? But, but I think uh, the the purpose of being able to develop something that large, either through simulation or AI, the the, the service is there, the infrastructure will be there. Right. The economical side of things is that the edge is not as expensive. It is a realization that we do need to sense a lot of things and we need to put a computational unit into it. But the important aspect of that research is that, well, we have to be power efficient. We have to be uh, logically efficient. We have to be AI implemented effectively. And, and, and coordinate more things and add communication to it, add security to it, and add all these bells and whistles that require a lot of consideration that makes even edge computation, even though small and, and cheap, uh, if you want something effective, it will require a lot of engineering considerations and designs and implementation. And so the research itself becomes uh, a triggering point of what exactly is that we're doing at the edge and what are we actually needed for? Is it for street lights? Is it for policing or is it for sensing or is it remote or is it urban or is it, you know, whatever? What kind of communications, Wi Fi, 5G, LoRa, what do we need? What it's actually required and if it's secure or not, right? And, it's, and if it breaks down, what do you do then? Right, mm -hmm. because these things are bound to break. They're mm -hmm. not long lasting, right? And so what do you, how do you engineer that? Because you have to have a solution for a county who wants to purchase these things and you know, make sure you have an effective product, right? So the research itself uh, in, in both cases, uh, the large scale of cloud and, and the way you want to simulate or develop an AI model based on that, that requires its own engineering aspect of things and the low level of edging it's and sometimes you have to interface both right because uh there's large data collections from the edge so the, there's there's levels to this right can i ask the question in a different way go back to your dissertation defense this is a problem that we're having what you just said was that at one time engineers could do great things in samples and they know if it worked or not and we use the normal curve to say it's a significant it work 100% of the time is significant at the 9.05 level. When you get to the big data and all the data that you have, everything is significant. You do not know what works and what does not work. So what does, what, what does, now you're sitting in your dissertation defense, <laughs> what does big data do to the normal curve? So the last paper that I published, I had, I could have had 10 million people because everything was significant. What we used to say is that with this bridge work, yes, we did the sampling in the laboratory. With this airplane fly, yes, we did the sampling in the laboratory. But now with so much data, when you run the efficiency of it, everything is significant. So is the normal curve out in terms of testing and expectations? How, how do we test these things now in the era of so much data and big data? Yeah, well, that's why, that's why universities are offering data analytical programs, right? Because you have to find a way to make any correlations and any effective parts of, of your data. Uh, you know, people want to be able to explain things, yeah, right? You cannot, just, you cannot just say, I have a lot of data, it works. And not knowing the why is it's actually concerning, right? Especially if you're running a company. 
So I think I think the explainability of, of things is important and understanding what you're doing with data, understanding the mathematical and statistical components that go into it to understand data becomes an important aspect of why we hire so many people now that are just data scientists. That's right. We need people finance. to spend months in it. Yeah. Right. Finance did away with that a long time ago. They don't care. That's why we have the <laughs> financial crisis. <laughs> Oh, okay. That explains it. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> so, so, so I've always said, and I wrote in my book, The Advanced Smart Grid in 2011, that got revised in 2015, that somehow the answers to what we are witnessing is basically the replication of the most sophisticated machine ever invented, which is a human being. And when you think about the cloud, to me, the cloud is the conscious brain, but we have two other brains that are performing functions like you know, pumping the heart and breathing the lungs and all those things that we don't think about. They just happen. Mm -hmm. But something is making that happen. And, and there's our specific dedicated networks with sensors. And, you know, when I put my hand on something hot and I move it, I'm not thinking of moving it. I'm just moving it because the fingers have an alarm system of temperature and they just move themselves, right? And so as mm -hmm. we are trying to uh, digitize the whole planet to get to Tron, and be able to switch from the analog into the machine and play the games uh, when everything is digitized. Uh, this whole balance of cloud and edge and sensors everywhere and AI apply to tiny little problems or large little problems seems to me like a fascinating journey to, to I mean, it's like a, it's a buffet of opportunity. Yeah, yeah. And, and one of the things humans are really bad at uh is forecasting anything mm -hmm. um so uh we don't have a good track record on that and i think it's it's hard to say in the confidence that this is going to work out really well um uh, it, it, it's going to take a lot of skilled people and very interesting people that not just have the dedication for these things but we're going to need people that find it purposeful. I think that one of the, I think what the young generation of students that I see coming through the classrooms is that if you sell them the purpose, they'll invest in the time and energy in it. And I think as the world gets more complicated, more digital, like you said, mm -hmm. they're, they're going into something different than we ever did. And so we have to find that unique purpose they can bring into the table that that's going to really help out more people than and more students going through any situation we implement in the future right right Llewellyn yes thank you I I find it very interesting and this is building really on what John asks in a, in a more um, professional way and that is how do we get invention out of the lab and into the market the national laboratories the 17 of them i used to spend a lot of time at five of them and uh, i worked a bit on the so-called cooperative research and development agreements craters i helped uh, with the, constructing those and they're, they're clumsy they're not very good how do we get great inventions out of the laboratory into the marketplace or into a place where they can start evolving in a less hothoused environment. And I've right. seen some marvelous things at Sandia, at Oak Ridge, at uh, Lawrence Livermore, um, yeah. but they never made it to market. Um, they just kind of disappeared. Interesting to talk about. Uh, so I wonder if you think about this at all. I used to antagonize uh, people at Sandia by saying, I can get all the data out of here. I can really start a lot of companies, just fire all the best people here, and they'll take the technology out. <laughs> and one day the, the director said to me, would you stop saying that? Just because you're right, I don't want to hear it anymore. <laughs> He's a troublemaker. Uh, I love it. Uh, the. the I think research has to have an applied aspect in where there's something at stake to, to just oversimplify the question you have. I think the research just to be theoretical, it, it, it can serve a purpose, but nothing 
that can help you market and put a product out there. I think partnerships with companies can actually accelerate that quite a lot. I think the federal government make can actually put that purpose into their uh, funding right at any level, local, state, or federal. Uh, but there's got to be something at stake. I think if you put something like, you know, like my research is that I feel like there's something at stake. Like we need to push this eventually to production, test it out, look into it. Because there's there's something at stake that I think there's a purpose of what we're doing the work in the lab into the, the community will matter. So I think that could be a good pressure to put on professors sometimes, right? To actually be engineers, like how crazy that is, right? To, to actually engineer from an engineer, right? And, and actually do something with it, right? Don't just be theoretical. Don't be comfortable in your office, right? There's, there's, there's something at stake that should be rewarded and be satisfactory, not just to you, but all the students that you bring in. And I think everybody gets excited, hence everybody wins. I, I have a final follow-up, if you don't mind, and that is um, I, I'm, I'm, I've noticed wherever something great is done, it takes cross disciplines. Uh, you need a lot of different disciplines to undertake any large engineering project. You can't have just one, you need five to move it ahead. Five seems to be very necessary. And I'm wondering in your work, do you ever see anything that would have medical application? One of the exciting things about AI is medical application. I've done a couple of television programs on this. Um, so I wonder if you see anything you're doing that you think could help in medicine i i would love to i i, I love medicine myself i uh, once pondered going to medical school and not into the engineering uh, side mainly because of family who are mds but um i i mean i don't have the data i i, I need a medical doctor to collaborate with right there's got to be some kind of need out there hospitals, uh, private practice, I don't know, something, NIH, obviously. But, um, the, I mean, AI makes sense in, in, in a certain way of how we're diagnosing things and doing treatments and and how we help doctors and, and, and people of care. And so... And, of I, course, off-label yeah. uses for drugs. AI is wonderful. Uh, yeah. I yeah. I mean, we, we used it for COVID, right? Uh, the people at, at San Diego figuring out the molecule structure of COVID and the way they used AI in HPC simulations uh, with their data center was incredibly, incredibly amazing to watch. And, and so all these things uh, I'm interested in, I'm just, I'm not in that field, right? I read about them. I, I love to watch them when they have something on, but um, Maybe eventually I'll be involved more into that, but for now I'm I'm not nowhere into that. Thank you very much. I thought that was extraordinarily interesting. Thank you. Yes. I think it's very, very interesting. And that remember that it's not the medical doctors that do the research. It's the people <laughs> in biology, yeah, right. chemistry that really makes the medical profession. Yes. So, Biomolecular people, yes. Molecular and people. Biochemistry, remember, yeah. Also, when it comes to nanotechnology, they are using the exact same tools that engineers have been using to explore the human body. Absolutely. I, I, think, the, I think the revolution in biology will make the computer revolution look like a penny in the future. Yeah, I think absolutely. Able, that's what I think. I think uh, people will be able to choose how they look. That means everybody won't look like me. Uh, people will choose <laughs> what their height would be. That means everybody want to be 6'4 like me. <laughs> everybody want to choose to play a guitar. Everybody play a guitar like me. Yeah. Yeah, like me. Can, uh, we, can, <laughs> we, can we Can we? engineer out? Not to mention my gorgeous color. But let's not talk about that. Let's not talk about that. engineer out the BS quotient. <laughs> That would be useful to see, actually. Let me tell you, as a professor with the with the dovetailing of uh, of disciplines, it's awesome. I would say talk to the kid, uh, to the professors in biology, chemistry, nanotechnology, nanobiology, 
because it's all overlapping. And as you know, uh, what, yes. what are we going to do with mechanic engineering? I don't know. We, I mean, our mechanic engineering grant started drying up in favor of bio, bioengineering and, uh, and software engineering. So yeah. you're an exciting uh, three things under work at all the time. I want you to have a professorship, an endowed professorship, and that'll be wonderful. Thanks you for coming on the program. Damien, Damien, party, party thoughts. What's in front of Dr. Vi is the next uh, semester is coming up. What's going to happen in the fall semester? Tell us real quick. Uh, I'll be teaching the machine learning class. That's going to be exciting. I have a full, <laughs> full class already registered for that. Um, so I'll be talking a lot more AI. Uh, I'm going off for tenure. So uh, I'm preparing my package for, for tenure and uh, we'll cross fingers on that. Hopefully I'll make it for Christmas. And then um, we'll have, uh, well, exciting more grants proposals and I'm writing more of the uh, project ideas I have. And so there's some deadlines for me uh, with NSF and other uh, part with Cedar and, um, mm -hmm. you know, work, working along with uh, folks with new projects that look uh, innovative enough for, for us to continue working with industry partners and, and the research community so absolutely a lot going on what, what one of the things that i want you to think about and i'm going to circle back with you is i want you to do a keynote on ai ml uh research uh at digital Sounds research good. thing and uh we'll, we'll i'll circle back with you uh because i got some slots and i haven't talked to you yet but you, you know you're one of the rock stars so i'm um, just <laughs> well, right. appreciate it Pencil that in. And I'll circle back with the details. We'll figure out the right day for that, either the 26th through the 28th. And then I assume that you're going to be on the lab tour that we'll do on the 29th. You'll be at destination. Well, that would be great. I'm happy to bring um, welcome people into the lab. All right. Well, thank thank you much, gentlemen. Final thoughts. I just want to thank you, Damon. You're a very very brilliant man. Thank you. Uh, good you, luck with tenure. You. you got a good Thank break. You. If they don't give you tenure, we'll go somewhere else. But good luck with tenure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right, John, take us away. At a time when the world seems to be spinning hopelessly out of control. They're deceivers and believers, and the only. How do you go, gentlemen? Bye bye. I feel now a place to go. This is not an editorial comment. I have to Same go. Same old song. This line I Beautiful, beautiful. Thank well you, done, John, John Butler. Thank you.